The year is 1902. Teddy Roosevelt is the President of the United States. We are here to celebrate the publication of a new book, The Two Islands, by the University of Oregon's Professor of Geology and Natural History, Thomas Condon. celebrate the, the publication of my book. I hope it's been long awaited. Uh, people have not written a lot about the geology of Oregon until now. I am today going to use the advantages of modern technology and we are going to look at plates from my book. Now all of you are acquainted with the fact that there is a new process with photography that allows photographs to be used commonly in books and even in your newspapers. You can remember just a few years ago that there were no photos, no photographic plates used in newspapers because artists had to draw what you saw in the paper. But that half-tone process, part of that advance of modern technology, uh, you, you've all heard of the kinetoscope with moving pictures, moving photographs. Uh, Thomas Edison, that, that uh, once young inventor, uh, you know, he actually asked for some platinum. And I had found some platinum down by Newport and loaned him platinum. So I'd like to say I had some uh, effect, perhaps, on, on some of his inventive genius or some of what he's been able to produce. All of you are probably familiar. I recognize some, some uh, faces in the audience. All of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the fact that I, my wife and I both came as a congregational missionary couple. So today, we are going to talk about fossils, but what we're really talking about are God's footprints. The actual evidence of the creation uh, of the planet that we enjoy. And we will use that, that modern technology. Now, what modern technology am I talking about? No, I'm not talking about electricity finally coming to Eugene. I'm not talking about the replacement of your gas lights. I'm talking about the magic lantern slide projector. Okay, and that gives us the ability to project some of the plates from the book. But before we go further, I would like to take the, the opportunity to explain why fossils are so important. But let me apologize my eyes have grown weaker with age, and as you can probably tell, I'm nearing retirement. So forgive me if I put on my spectacles. And I would like to read you, I won't bore you with a lot of the book, uh, but I would like to read you one particular passage, which I think well explains why fossils are so important. The perfection of this mode of preservation is well nigh complete. The minutest vein work of the leaf, the insect that fastened to its surface, the seed pod or capsule of the plant, the pores of the wood, the sutures of the animal's skull, the epiphyses, that's where the joint comes together, the joining of bones, the epiphyses of the bones, enabling one to tell at a glance whether those belong to the young or the old the minutest lines of age or accident on a tooth. All are preserved with marvelous faithfulness to the life type of the period, so that no family of plants or animals is likely to have lived on the borders of the lake, we'll talk about lakes and water, during that long stretch of time, covering hundreds of thousands of years, without sharing in the record of its fossil history. Now, I just mentioned hundreds of thousands of years. Let me explain. I didn't notice, well, I noticed some people stiffening their seats. Uh, there, of course, is a great debate 
that has gone on in the country having to do with science. And of course, it's a debate that has gone on far earlier than just in this country, uh, between religion and science. And I want to point out to you all that Genesis, nowhere, defines a day as 24 hours. It's not in Genesis. I want you also to think of Genesis for a moment. And the water comes first, and the land comes second. And we'll talk about how that describes pork. But first, I would like to talk about chalk. I'm going to use some terminology that geologists use. And I want to explain to you where the terms come from, because the terms themselves are important. We're going to talk about some periods of time, as indicated in the geology. And the first period of time is the Cretaceous. And the Cretaceous is from Latin. The Cretaceous is from Latin. Uh, and do we have any Latin scholars in the audience? <laughs> Cretaceous means chalk. Now, some of you have probably visited the British Isles. Some of you have probably seen either photographs, artistic renderings, or, or actually visited and seen the White Cliffs of Dover. Would anyone like to guess how high, how thick the deposit that the White Cliffs of Dover are on? 384 feet. 384 feet. And what I, would anyone like to tell me what chalk is composed of? Diatoms, okay, microscopic animals that live in the sea, and after their life is over, they fall to the bottom, they create an ooze, and the ooze ultimately is put under pressure of more diatoms right, falling on top, until eventually it becomes rock. It's very soft rock. But think about the amount of time it takes, or took, to create 384 feet. And if I tell you that the 384 feet of chalk underlies all of Northern Europe, you can now assume that Northern Europe was once underwater, just like Oregon was. I have a trick question now, and the question has to do with dinosaurs. How many dinosaurs did Oregon ever have? Probably, well, none. Because it was no land mass, it was underwater. Sir, have you taken my class? <laughs> That's an excellent answer, sir, and it's certainly correct. Now, I'm, I'm actually going to ask one of my advanced students now to operate our modern technology uh, and to turn on our magic slide projector. And we should be able to look at some of the plates from the book. And we'll be starting with Cretaceous Beak. No gas lights are somewhat work. Let's see, where was I? Cretaceous. Cretaceous beach. Because no dinosaurs, because we were underwater. If you take a look at this particular fossil, because we're not looking at the original components anymore, we're looking at the, at least the biological components have been turned to stone, have been turned to fossils. What you can all see here is one of the most common rocks in Oregon, and that's basalt trap to Easterners. Uh, these rounded pieces here are all basalt and from a much earlier period than the Cretaceous. In fact, the ocean has pounded on the coast long enough in this case to make basalt, which is certainly not very soft, a rounded object. And these objects are embedded in a matrix that consists <laughs> of crushed seashells. And what you are seeing are the crushed seashells which then compose this matrix that the older basalt is part of. This is Cretaceous beach. Okay. So this is beach in that period where had we more land, we would have had dinosaurs. Next slide. How big was that? How big that is it? It's about yay. It's about yay. Okay. Thank you. And where was it found? I would have to. I, I, <laughs> I would actually there have to say, sir, I would have to go back to my label. You can see one of my labels here. Uh, I am not an encyclopedia, sir. <laughs> but if I was to guess, I would say around Newport. 
Okay. This is Trigonia. These are animals, small animals from the Cretaceous period. And the Cretaceous period does not have a lot of commonality with animals today. This is one of the most common animals found in the Cretaceous. It's called a trilobite. Actually pre-existed before the Cretaceous, but it goes extinct. It has similarities with things like the horseshoe crab today, but it is not a species which continue. It really has some similarities. So this one went extinct, so did Trigonia. Now, what I started to explain was that the labels for these periods all have meanings. Cretaceous meant chalk. So that's the period where chalk was laid down. The next period we're going to be concerned with uh, is, well, is the tertiary. Uh, and the, this is divided up into three more time frames. Uh, the Miocene is the one we talk about the most, but beyond the Miocene is the Pliocene, and before the Miocene is the Eocene. And the Eocene means dawn. And what the Eocene for dawn means for us is that 5 to 10 percent of the fossils we would recognize because they have carried on and their descendants we would see today. Now the next period, closer to our time, the Miocene, about 30 percent of the fossils are animals that we would recognize. And then that last period, the Pliocene, okay, the Pliocene, more than 50 percent of the fossils we find Again, are animals or plants that we would recognize today. And then we will get into the Pleistocene, the Ice Ages, uh, and we would recognize many, many of the animals. The Cretaceous period was a period, the end of the age of reptiles. The tertiary that we're starting to talk about is the age of mammals. Next slide. Okay, this is Miocene Beach. And we're going to talk a lot about the John Day fossil beds. This particular uh, piece is from the John Day fossil beds. You, if you look at the shells, the bivalves that are, are shown here on this particular specimen, you will immediately see similarities with what you would find on the beach today. Let me pass around one of the bivalves from that period. We'll start it on a different side. Next slide. Now, Oregon, because of the volcanic activity that took place here so regularly, is an unparalleled archive of our geological history. And I say unparalleled very consciously because in this particular area, there is 1,500 feet of constant record of our past uh, here once the land rose from the sea. And what you can see here in this photograph from the John Day fossil beds is the layers of lava, the layers of basalt that have been laid down and protect the softer layers below. And that's why this is such an unparalleled record. The lava, the basalt, on very regular eruptions, or we could also say irregular eruptions, is protecting everything that lay beneath. Now, geologists pay attention to something called stratigraphy. Now, if you think of layer cakes, that's the way you should think of this. But this is a 1,500-foot high layer cake. So this is terribly significant. And in layer cakes, or stratigraphy, what is on the bottom is assumed to be what is oldest. And then the layers that have been added are assumed to be younger. So if you're dealing with a horizontal surface, that always holds. Things get a little more complicated when the surfaces are no longer <laughs> horizontal. But as you can see here in the John Day fossil beds, fairly horizontal. So this is an unparalleled in the country record of Miocene times. It also touches Eocene and Pliocene, as we'll see with some of the animals we're going to deal with. Next slide. In my family, when we got to the Dalles, now I, we were first in St. Helens, we were then in Albany, we were in Forest Grove, we were outside of Corvallis as, as a missionary couple, but eventually we were sent to the Dalles. And we were very successful uh, in the Dalles, I had a very, very fine church going, uh, and I became known for collecting fossils. Now, 
if you think about the Columbia Gorge for a moment, you can understand. And if you think about the situation I was in, having arrived in 1853 without a library, or with a very small library, uh, here I was getting interested in geology, finding fossils, and what did I have to compare to? I did not have a, li a vast library, as those Eastern paleontologists and geologists had. So I built a comparative collection based on the, the skeletons of mammals and, and uh, other animals that I could find. My family made a joke of this. Now, for inspiration for my Sunday sermons, I would wander around with my geologist pick and, of course, find rocks, crack them open, and look to see whether I had flora or fauna. This particular bone here is a modern bone. It's from a mule. Now, it has no relation to the family joke that said that I trained a mule that was on its last legs to follow me around so that I could eventually have its bone structure for my comparative collection. So this has nothing to do with the mule that the family joked about. The other bones are all bones of the horse. Now, you've all been told the horse came to North America with Columbus. Well, that's true. But the horse originated perhaps in North America. We've had horses here uh, in geologic time. And let me pass around some of the teeth of one of those horses. And you will rapidly determine that these horses are not of the size of the horses that you and I are familiar with. But these are their ancestors. These are Miocene horses. Next slide. Now, I'm talking a lot about animals, but flora, plants, will tell you a lot about the environment, the climate, the weather that existed at the time of these animals. Here's one of the finest of the fossils that we have from the Miocene and from the John Day. Next slide. Okay, how can I make the claim that we had horses in, in such olden times? Well. It all started with this particular fossil right here. It's the distal end of the radius of a horse. Now that would be the foreleg. And the distal end means near, down near the hoof. This was found under 68 feet of gravel. 68 feet of gravel. People were drilling a well outside of Walla Walla. The Snake River there is more than 30 miles away, the closest body of water that could have created a lake. Now, gravel was created by water. Okay. A, a naturally occurring gravel deposits uh, occur in water uh, features. So this was once deposited 68 feet down. And it's Miocene. How did I know that? Well, I had a comparative collection. <laughs> And an English gentleman visiting at that time challenged me. He said, oh, that's ridiculous. Condon said, well, everyone knows that horses didn't, didn't exist here at that time. So I said, well, let's go down to a blacksmith and find out. So we took this particular piece, and we walked down to the blacksmith's shop, and I said, John, what do you think this is? He looked at it and said, horse. <coughs> I rest my case. How big was the horse? The horse was probably the size of a sheep. It was called in Europe, the uh, similar type horses are called an anotherium. Okay, but about the size of a sheep. And it had another interesting characteristic. It did not have one hoof or two hooves. It had three hooves. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and a little bit of what I will call development theory. Some people would call it evolution, natural selection. And this is where sometimes science and religion come into conflict. I have no such conflict. These are teeth from the antrotherium. Teeth from an ancient horse. Next slide. Okay, the, the horse is not the only animal that existed at that time. And I think if any of you saw any of the broadsides advertising my talk today, uh, we mentioned a, an animal called the Oreodont. Now, the oreodont no longer exists, but this is a plaster cast, a skull cast, which would show you what the, the skull would have looked like. This animal, also the size of the sheep, much more common than the horse. There were at least five different species of oreodont 
running around, and they ranged in size from the size of a pig to a small deer. Okay, now it is not, as you can see from the teeth here, flat. This one, because it's been cast around and mutilated slightly, kind of looks like a, a, a canine, but it is not. They actually were flat. And the difference between what you're seeing here and what I'm going to pass around is, of course, because my students, when this was taken, had not quite gotten a lot of the matrix away from the fossil. So there it is, an oreodont. If you look at the teeth, the teeth are similar to the horse, the pig, and the camel. The horse, the pig, and the camel. So a very interesting animal, intermediate between some of the animals that we would recognize today. Next slide. Okay, these are oreodont teeth, and you can see this animal was much bigger than this animal. Next slide. Remember, there are about five different groups of them. Let's talk about what weather and what climate might have been like at that time. And now I'm going to pass around a wonderful fossil of a fern. As well as a fossil of some willow. Now, I haven't yet talked about mountains, and I need to talk about the geological process involved in building mountain chains. Since, we, since the land came out of the water, we need a mechanism for that. And the mechanism, as best we understand this, is something similar to what happens when you put your apples up and put them into storage for the winter, so you can enjoy the apples later. What happens to the surface of the apple over time? It shrinks. It becomes shriveled. Now, think about what would happen to the surface of the Earth, knowing that the center, or at least below, is hot. We have lava to prove that. The volcanic eruptions that certainly Oregon has experienced over time demonstrate that. So hot below, cooler towards the surface. What happens when things cool? shrink. We, that, we believe, is those lateral pressures then, we think, push up areas which become our mountain chains. So they start as sea dikes, and as the land is pushed up and rises, they wind up being mountain chains. But they don't spring up full-blown right away. They grow over time. And it's that growth over time that then allows different weather patterns for the different animals that we find in the fossils. This is a rhinoceros. What kind of climate, what kind of weather do you associate with a rhinoceros? Jungle, tropical, and we think actually in this particular case probably subtropical, but the reason I passed the fern around is because ferns and palm trees are found at the same time that the rhinoceros and the antitherium, the horse, are found. Next slide. Okay, these are the teeth of the, the uh, rhinoceros. Again, an ancient rhinoceros, but nevertheless, we'd recognize it. Next slide. Now, I've been talking about the Miocene because that's the best represented period at the John Day, but it's not the only one. In the next period, an animal that probably we're all very familiar with, you may have one at home. But I want to talk a little bit for a moment about other geologists. As, as my knowledge base increased, and as people brought me more and more examples from the John Day, uh, Eastern paleontologists started to come to visit. I mentioned the English gentleman. Uh, well, the Eastern paleontologists, of course, didn't know much about Oregon, and they, they had heard that someone did, uh, so they came to me. Well, and I've already told you I didn't have much of a library. I was doing everything by comparison and, and eagerly read those few volumes I could get my hands on. One particular paleontologist came to visit. Uh, he shall go unnamed, but he's employed at Yale. Uh, and that particular uh, paleontologist uh, brought me a library. It was Darwin's Descent of Man, Origin of Species. I, I, I suddenly felt rich with books, 
Then he took advantage of me and borrowed some fossils. It had been my policy not to loan out fossils that I didn't have duplicates of. But in this particular case, I felt so good about the library that had been bestowed on me, I made the mistake of loaning him my fossils of the horse. And if I, well, let me grab it. If I was to show you the wonderful <coughs> illustration in what eventually became the textbook that my students used, and I was to tell you that at least two, at least two of the five examples cited in the text, here's the uh, evolution of the horse. I gotta cover up the name of the professor. Uh, <laughs> Some of these are my fossils, not his fossils. My name is never mentioned. I didn't publish in a scientific journal. I published in a commonly read journal here in Oregon. The Oregon Monthly, as I recall. So I didn't get credit, he did. Now, so I was a little tired of Eastern paleontologists stealing our thunder. And in this particular case, I found this fossil and I named it. And this is Canis ruestris, the country dog. Uh, this is a Pliocene animal. Uh, and as I said, you would be very familiar with this. I took one look at the skull and I said, there is not a lot of difference between this and modern canines. Not at all. So the country dog, I felt confident enough to name it. I will pass around Canis ruestris. Next slide. Now, we've now seen that we have dogs in the Pliocene. Now, the Pliocene is a little bit cooler. How do we know that? Because now we start to get some different flora. Okay, and if I tell you that we start to get oak, and the willow that I passed around a little bit earlier, okay, you're probably going to deduce that it's no longer tropical. Okay, now why is that? Well, now we're back to the mountain chains. Back during the Cretaceous, a new mountain chain started to come out of the, the sea, and that, that was the Rockies. Okay, and as the Rockies rose, more land rose with it, and that water that had been in the ocean had to drain. And geological features like the Columbia Gorge, the Deschutes Canyon, all familiar to us, those things are a result of all that water draining. But all the water didn't drain off at once, and we wound up with a lake system. And it's those lakes in the John Day that are in the Pliocene and in the Miocene and in the Eocene that allowed this wonderful record to be created, then covered over by a volcanic eruption, and then life would return and then get covered again, and that's how we got the layer cave. This is another of uh, Canis Rurestris. So now we've got the Rockies, but I haven't, uh, I, we haven't gotten to Oregon yet. <laughs> The same processes, the, the shrinkage of the crust, now force up a new mountain range, and that's the Cascades. Now the Cascades, as I said before, just like the Rockies, don't start off full-blown. They start off actually small and continue to rise. Now when they were small, the moist air from the Pacific had no problem with creating a tropical or subtropical climate for our earliest animals and our earliest plants. But as they got higher and higher, they start to block those tropical, the, the, uh, the wet winds from the Pacific, and now it gets a little bit colder and drier. And that explains some of what we see in this change of flora and fauna between the Miocene and the Pliocene. Now Canis rurestris is Pliocene, and notice that this particular Canis has a shorter snout and a broader snout. Next slide. So there's several species running around. We talked horse earlier. This is not a Miocene horse. This is a Pliocene horse. This is Hipparion. This is also found in Europe. Uh, and notice that there is a long central bone and flange here. And then there are these two shorter ones. Remember we talked about three hooves? This is the evidence of the three hooves. Now what we don't know is what advantage three hooves gave one of these animals. This animal is bigger than our earlier Miocene horse. This animal in actuality is closer to a, a small deer in size or even perhaps an antelope. Uh, but three hooves. Now, does that give one an advantage in uneven ground perhaps? Swampy ground? Perhaps. 
But we're not sure. What we do know is the bone structure says there were three hooves. Now, how do we get a modern horse with one hoof? Well, if you look at a modern horse uh, hoof and leg, you will find that these retract and there are vestigial splints still on the modern horse. And that's the result of once being three-toed, now being one-toed, and the, the modern hoof. Next slide. So this is Hipparion from the Pliocene. Well, I introduced the dog. There's another animal that you would recognize from the Pliocene. It goes meow, but this is a big meow. Uh, and if you take a look at the jaw structure here, this is clear. <laughs> the canines, this is clearly felis. This is cat. This is cat. And this is Pliocene. Uh, next slide. Okay, one of the last animals that we see during the Pliocene is basically the broad-faced ox. And that's what this animal is. Next slide. Now we're out of the tertiary. Now we're getting into the ice ages, and I have to create another mountain range. Okay, now we've got the Cascades, we have the Rockies, but I haven't done the Coast Range yet. Now the Coast Range is going to start to come up, and we have something that I've labeled the Willamette Sound, because the same thing happened in the Willamette Valley that happened to the east, and that's that there was water. It needed to drain away, but it didn't drain away right away. But after it drained, after the coast range got high enough, we wound up with land animals. And they were in the, during the ice ages, this is the tooth of a mammoth. Okay, so this is an elephant. This is an elephant relative. And there were four teeth, one, two on the bottom, two on the top. But this is Pleistocene. This is the most commonly found fossil in the Willamette Valley. Every time someone digs a mill race, digs a well, uh, disturbs the ground generally. The, either the tusks or the teeth of the mammoth are very, very commonly found. But that's that different period now. Now we're into a period where we recognize most of the animals uh, and their descendants today. That's the last slide of, of, uh, from the book. Let me go ahead and turn off our magic lantern slide projector. The geological record found in Oregon is so good that eventually we will have something to say about the antiquity of man in North America. But at the moment, we can't make that. We have not been able to link man with any of those earlier periods uh, that we would like to. But because the geological record here is so good, it's my feeling that in the future we'll be able to do that. I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my wife and I and some of our experiences before we conclude the, the lecture this afternoon, so you'll, you'll ha have at least some feeling uh, about, about us. Uh, and I say us. My uh, dear wife, uh, Cornelia, passed on just about a year ago. I, I've just taken the, the morning band off my, my uh, frock coat. But I do want to show you, Cornelia, uh, after I graduated from, from seminary, uh, she turned me down three times. <laughs> and missionaries do not get sent as bachelors uh, out west. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think we have the time for me to, to wander all the way back, but if anyone following the lecture would like to, to see Cornelia's image, uh, I'd be glad to give you a close-up look. Uh, We've had eight children over the time. Six have lived to become adults. We arrived by clipper ship. Uh, now, I had been a teacher in, in uh, upper New York State, uh, and of course, that's a state that glaciers had scraped. And I was very familiar with what I call trap rock at that time. We call it basalt here. Uh, and the, the evidence of, of uh, those earlier periods, uh, Cretaceous, and, Trilobites that I showed you early on, trilobites were, were relatively common. But those later periods aren't represented, you see. They're, they're, they're not represented as they are here in Oregon. Uh, but she turned me down three times. Uh, daughter of a, a shoemaker, I had met her uh, in, in some of my family uh, were looking for lodging and, and uh, uh, basically uh, I had been introduced to her 
I was very impressed with her, obviously, but she turned me down three times. And, and you know, that sailing date for the, the, uh, the Clipper was, was approaching, so I, I, we did not have a lot of furniture, we did not have a lot of baggage. Uh, th this particular Clipper, the trade wind, uh, was on its second voyage. It was the first Clipper built in New York City. Uh, it was on its second voyage, uh, 245 feet long, uh, 40 or so feet wide, crew of 60, 50 passengers. She could carry 3,400 tons. Uh, she did about seven knots, 12 on a good day. And we had eight families of missionaries. It was the largest missionary group the American Missionary Society had ever sent out. Six of the missionary families were going to California, two to Oregon. You have perhaps heard of the other Oregon missionary, uh, Dr. Obed Dickinson. Uh, he, uh, during the late rebellion and, and prior to it, he uh, got lots of publicity, a very, uh, very avid abolitionist. Uh, and, and of course, being a Congregationalist myself, uh, I did not favor slavery either, but I, I was not the crusader that uh, Dickinson was. Well, Dickinson, when we arrived, uh, got Portland and I got St. Helens. Perhaps that's because I was an Irishman. <laughs> Came over at age 11. Uh, fire in my life has, has uh, actually contributed uh, many aspects and signs, if you will, uh, from the Almighty uh, for me. Uh, in New York City when I was a boy, uh, I didn't have much formal schooling, but I was sent out and uh, lent out to various families. First to a, 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 a Eliza Cox. Uh, she was the daughter of a florist. And, and, uh, she taught me to read, uh, a very important aspect of being a paleontologist, uh, or at least a scholar. Uh, and from there, I was, I was uh, sent out to a, a judge, a judge's family, uh, and introduced to an Irish patriot by the name of Samson. Uh, but Mrs. McNevin, uh, my, my, the judge's wife, Mrs. McNevin said, Thomas, you need to make something of yourself. I've never quite forgotten that, and, and I hope she's smiling at me now uh, from above, uh, having perhaps uh, accomplished something with the, the publication of my book. I, I, I mentioned the trade wind, uh, Captain Nathaniel Weber, the clipper, uh, and I mentioned fire. Well, in New York City as a boy, I observed a huge fire uh, not long after arrival, and they had to use black powder to destroy buildings to create a, a fire break in order to stop this, this uh, immense fire, something like 17 blocks were burnt. Well, on, our, on the Clipper, on our voyage off of South America, we had a fire. Can you imagine a fire on a wooden ship? At one point, we had 16 sailors laid out on the deck, uh, having been short of being asphyxiated, we, we dragged them out of the hold uh, to get them more oxygen. Uh, but we had a, a bucket brigade uh, set up to put out the fire, how do you get a fire in a, a wooden ship? Well, cooking on a wooden ship, if you haven't been on one, means that you're cooking on a platform covered with sand on a deck. And of course, if sparks get off of the platform, you've got a problem, particularly if they get in the hold, and that's what happened. We were off the coast of Brazil. It was the 21st day of the journey. Uh, and Captain Weber said, everyone return to your cabins and take a small, pick a number of items uh, that you might be able to put in a life. And no one wants to hear that. The crew was muttering, we've got a group of missionaries here. How can we have bad luck and have a fire? <laughs> well, after the fire was put out, it took about a day to, to fight the fire. Captain Weber actually, uh, and one of the reasons we didn't have the fastest time that year to San Francisco, we were 450 miles off coast. Uh, he headed in, he was going to beach the ship. You know, if we didn't have to get into the boats, he was going to beach her. Uh, we, we tossed cargo overboard, but we put the fire out, and after the fire went out, the crew changed their tune. They said, hmm, maybe those prayers from those missionaries actually did some good. <laughs> At any rate, we, we arrived in, in uh, San Francisco uh, 103 days. The voyage took 103 days, so we were the fifth fastest voyage that year. Fifth fastest. Uh, one wonders how we would have done if we had not detoured in towards the coast of Brazil. But that was not to be. 
We arrived, I got assigned to St. Helens. Uh, both uh, Cornelia and I had been teachers uh, in our past lives, uh, and we continued to be teachers uh, in Oregon. That got us into trouble with the Missionary Society, because people back east do not understand that Oregonians have no use for people who will not get their hands dirty. And if all I did was write sermons and wander around looking for inspiration for sermons, no one would have come to any services. Nobody. So Cornelia and I regularly tried to supplement our income and help Oregonians and teach. And that was always a thorn under the saddle, if you will, or a burr under the saddle for the American Missionary Society. We never resolved that, and we continued to teach, and they continued to complain. <laughs> Well, we ultimately we wind up in the Dalles, and fire again is a, a problem, because the year 1871, does anyone remember what happened in Chicago in 1871? A cow kicked over a lantern, and a lot of Chicago burned. Well, in the Dalles, we had a fire, and my house was saved, fortunately, but only, only because one of those paleontologists who visited tried to buy my collection. And when I wouldn't sell, he said, well, it's valuable enough, that you need to take some precautions because you're in a wooden town and if the wind is right, you, you know, your house is going to burn. <coughs> well, there was a fire, not very, you know, several weeks later, but I had already taken some precautions, some barrels full of water, some old rugs that we could uh, wet uh, and, and wet the roof down. Uh, and after the fire was put out and the house had survived, I went down to look for my collection and it was gone. The collection was gone. And slowly, over the next week, people brought the collection back. Children, adults, knew the value of the collection, and they protected it, wandered off with it, and then brought it back. So I lost very little. Uh, so as you can tell, somewhat highly regarded uh, in Dallas, in the Dallas. Uh, and you may remember that the Dallas was a pretty rough and woolly town. It was the gateway to the Idaho gold fields for many years. Uh, the gamblers in town actually uh, played a joke, uh, which I took well and actually turned back on them. They gave me a gambler's coat with many pockets. It, 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 it was a winter coat. It reached almost down to my, my, uh, my toe, the toes of my boots. Uh, and I had Cornelia shorten it a bit, but I then wore it around. And the, the, even the gamblers, I, I will say, uh, ultimately uh, came to services uh, with us. I left the church in very good shape in the year 1873, and 1872 was a problem. Uh, I had been teaching my eldest boy, Edward, to become a geologist like myself. And he had had his first opportunity that summer to go off without me, and he brought back crate after crate from John Day. And then he took sick, and in February he died. So I got my second son, uh, and Seymour, and we piled on a Concord stage and headed down to Deschutes Canyon. And we didn't get any further, because the wheel horses slipped, the coach flipped, and a 250-pound passenger landed on top of me. Well, as you can tell, I am not a large man, uh, and a large man landed on top. And I uh, broke a shoulder bone, crushed some ribs, contusions of the lung, the physician told me. Uh, I did not have a field season that year. I think God was trying to tell me something. And in December he did. Jane, our youngest, age five, died. So two children in one year. My, my, the older children were of an age now where I needed to worry about higher education if I wanted them to get formal education. The Dallas was not the place to be. Uh, and I was offered a position at, at uh, uh, in Forest Grove at Pacific, uh, what would become Pacific uh, University. Uh, and I took a position as lecturer and a, a trustee, uh, but I was really waiting for something. And you may remember that in the same year, the legislature uh, basically established the fact that we were going to have a University of Oregon. Now, what most people have forgotten is why Eugene got the University of Oregon and how fragile, how fragile those early years were for the university. Does anyone remember how we got it? 
because all the communities to the north of us in the Willamette Valley were greedy, and they individually were agitating for the University of Oregon. But we created a coalition of the communities south of here who didn't want the university one inch further in the Willamette Valley. They wanted it a little more accessible. And because we had a united front, we were then able to get the University of Oregon. It opened two years late. How many remember that? Two years late. Well, there was trouble raising the money. And we took chickens and, and, and hay and barley. We did all sorts of things in order to, to raise the money. We had said we would give, we would build a building uh, and it would be debt free and we would also give the state $55,000. And it turned out the $55,000 was harder than the building uh, to raise. And when we opened in 1870, uh, when we opened in 1876, When we opened, in six, when we opened, only one floor was ready in the building. There is a wonderful photograph of students sitting in all the windows, but only one floor, one floor was ready. Obviously, the other floors were, were completed. My family uh, and I started the vacation in Newport during the summers, so we went to the coast. And in 1881, I got a telegram. The telegram said, how much of your salary this year would you like to contribute to keeping the University of Oregon open? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how fragile things were, folks. And the savior of the University of Oregon was Henry Villard, the railroad man, uh, and Judge Deedee, uh, who was the, the chair of the trustees at the time. Judge Deedee wrote to Henry Villard and said, we have a real problem. And Villard's response was, how big is the check I need to write? And with one check, Henry Villard wiped out the debt of the University of Oregon. And I think sometimes people today have trouble remembering that because we have such a vigorous institution. I, I, I want to mention uh, uh, Cornelia and, and, and my family again. Uh, Cornelia and I uh, have not been particularly crusaders, uh, but as you know from my congregational affiliations and the fact we now have a congregational church in town that uh, we established or helped establish. Uh, we, I'm a temperance man and always have been. Uh, I don't think you can see the blue ribbon on my, my lapel. Uh, but I, I've been president of our temperance society and Cornelia has represented the, uh, the state uh, at, national, uh, at national meetings. She's traveled to Colorado and then in 1893 she went to the Chicago Exposition. The, the, uh, by her, well, not by herself, she took Ellen with her. Uh, but she then saw relatives she had not seen in 40 years at the Chicago Exposition. I had to stay, my duties kept me here, but I'm very proud of my wife. Uh, we also uh, are in favor of women's suffrage. Someday you women will get the vote. Uh, and and uh, you may remember not so long ago, about a hundred of, a, a of us went down to the polling place during a school board and tried to vote, because by Oregon law, women who are property owners are eligible to vote, but only in the school board elections. And we were turned away in Lane County. In some counties in this, in this state, women were allowed to vote, but not in Lane County. Well, uh, probably enough of, of, of reminiscing. Let me tell one more story, uh, and then I'll finish. Native Americans, uh, uh, Indians, that are, are normal, our Chinook tribe in, in particular. The Chinook have a legend. And I think Native Americans have something to tell us about the antiquity of man in North America. And the reason for that is this legend that they have is, has to do with a natural bridge that went across the Columbia. Now we all know there's no natural bridge across the Columbia. But they also talk at the same time of the fact that two of the mountains fought with one another, Mount Hood and Mount St. Helens. And they said there was smoke and fire and rocks and the earth shook. What does that sound like? It sounds like volcanic activity. Now, unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot really date when the last eruptions took place. But it sounds to me like they were Chinook here 
when those volcanic eruptions, those last eruptions took place, and that led then to the collapse of the natural bridge and the, if you will, the problems on navigation of the Columbia today with the Cascades, Celilo Falls, there you've got the remains of the natural bridge. But that's speculation. <coughs> I, once again, I think that ultimately Oregon will have something to say about the antiquity of man on the North American continent. Thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, I hope I have told you a little bit about God's footprints, uh, how the creation we enjoy every day uh, was created, uh, and I'll be glad to uh, talk to folks after the, the uh, program. Why the title to character to answer questions, because answering questions as Condon is a little more difficult. Why well, the title of the book, Two Islands? That's ah, true. thank you. you paying attention. <coughs> but you must have taken one of my classes. <laughs> okay, Two Islands. Uh, I talked about the, basically the north-south eruptions, if you will, from the sea floor uh, that created our mountain chains. But there were two that were non-directional. All the ones I talked about are north to south. And there are the two non-directional ones are basically your Siskiyous, and I called it the Siskiyou Island. Okay, so it's not north-south. It actually interrupts the chain that is north-south. And then the other one is the Blues. Uh, I called that the Shoshone Island. Today we, we uh, tend to call it the Blues. But again, the same thing. It doesn't follow the same fissure, if you will, uh, pattern. It's not a north-south disruption. It's a non-directional one. And it's on top of those two islands that you find our oldest Cretaceous sea beach. And, and other, with, it's the fact that that beach is up on these mountains, which leads everyone to assume that we were once underwater, because how do we wind up with beach on the mountain otherwise? Sir. Thank you for the question. Other questions? Uh, actually, if we turn the slides back on, I do have a few more things to show you. Uh, but I can't do them as content. I have to do them as well. Uh, uh, my daughter, Ellen, she was the first valedictorian of the first graduating class from the University of Oregon. Um, and she later became my assistant, and in fact, it was that assistantship which allowed me the time off from my classes and the recitations that that involved uh, to write the book. Okay, this is the trade winds. If you actually Google it, there are several paintings of it. She was very fast, uh, and Weber apparently was a very noted navigator. So, you know, his, his whole routine about turning towards the coast, he was going to beat her, you know, told everyone, you know, find some stuff that you want to take into a lifeboat. A very, very competent captain. But the trade winds. Okay, next slide. Okay, Salilo Falls. You know, now, Salilo Falls is <coughs> very important for, uh, I think I, the one slip I remember making during the program was I called them Native Americans. Uh, the, the, uh, the, I'm going to call them Indians for the moment. Uh, fishing rights. And of course, Salilo covered by the, the dams that later make navigation of the Columbia not quite a cinch, but make it considerably easier than it was in, in Condon's day. Uh, but, Perhaps, along with the Cascades, a, you know, evidence of that bridge, or at least a dam that uh, backed up the Columbia at one point. There are submerged forests in the, along the Columbia, uh, which probably again reflect in the volcanic activity. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is an actual magic lantern slide projector. You can see the base <laughs> of the hurricane. <laughs> okay, they did get more sophisticated, and actually by the time, by 1902, they would have been more sophisticated. Next slide. I do apologize, this one isn't tremendously in focus, but you get an idea. This is a, a more complicated magic lantern slide projector. This is a really complex one, and we actually have one of these, but it's electrified. So they were actually used into the period of electricity. Okay, here he is. This is Dr. Condon. Count how many women are in the class. Um, remember I said he, would, he, he yeah, basically uh, supported suffrage. What I, what I want you to notice for a moment, though, is many of the ladies are holding a particular book. Condon had to be pushed to pick a textbook. He didn't like the idea. Actually, I guess I put it over here. He didn't like the idea of having to have a textbook because he, 
he believed in what we would today call experiential learning. Uh, and he took people out on field trips and, and handed them fossils and said, you know, you tell me about what you find. One thing we can do is look at the length of the title. We can't, these images aren't good enough to resolve what the title actually is, but they are good enough to tell how long the words are. Elements of Geology by Lacan. It's published during the right time period. One of Condon's friends at the University of California, a younger friend. Uh, there it is. That's the class, if you will, of 1896. They're the ones who chose the green and yellow colors for the University of Oregon. And next slide. Okay, Condon, interestingly enough, never made Crater Lake. But he did make Oregon Caves, today a, a national monument. Uh, and he took a group of friends, not students down there, and they actually autographed a rock. And if you'd been on one of the cave tours, uh, basically a translucent sheath of rock has now formed over the graffiti. So the graffiti is now entombed in rock, uh, and Condon's signature's at the top with a bunch of the, 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 uh, the other members. Uh, for those who like trivia, he left his toolkit, which he had brought into the cave, lost the toolkit, and at least the park, as far as the Park Service knows, the toolkit has never been found. So if you go on a tour of uh, Oregon caves, look for the toolkit. Anyway, uh, Condon visited there. Next slide. And this is Condon's second home. The first one was at uh, Patterson and, and uh, 11th. This one was at High and 11th. Uh, after they built Villard Hall, obviously dedicated to Henry Millard who saved them. Uh, this one was at 11th and High. Uh, he bought, well, he basically bought a different property and, and uh, this wonderful French Second Empire house was built. And in those days, this addition had not put on. Uh, Doug Card has done some research. Doug Card, uh, one of our local historians, actually has lived in uh, this particular house when, back when he was a student uh, and probably when he taught as well. Uh, and the, Ellen and her husband and two children moved in with him in his dotage. Uh, and they obviously were living in that section. But this uh, house, uh, you can see, is in need of some work. It's been uh, purchased very recently. had a tour just this week of uh, the interior. Uh, they're going to try and put it on the National Register, and they're interested in saving it. You know, something that Eugene certainly needs more of. Where, where is it? Uh, today it's 1268 Jackson. Like many, like many old homes in those days, they were movable. Okay, and of course, if I told you it actually doesn't sit in a concrete foundation on the ground, it's sitting on rocks. That's how they built them, and that's what made them very movable. <laughs> I, like our clerks building outside, sitting on rocks. Probably someday we're going to need to put it on a, a real foundation. Other questions? That's about it, folks. Uh, if anyone wants to talk to me afterwards, delighted to do that. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit about 19th century and early 20th geology. Uh, I will tell you that it's not modern geology, but modern geologists say that Condon had a good eye, made good observations, uh, and although we know about plate tectonics and he didn't, uh, I love the, the image of the apple and shriveling up. Thank you, folks. Thank you.